G'day folks, Mark Newton back again. And this time I'm doing the second video in the Comparative Adaptive Morphology of Scorpions series. If you haven't seen the first one, the first one was on the uh, scorpion's tail. I'll leave a link underneath the video in the video description um, so you can go and see if you've got time have a look at that one uh, as well. So Comparative Adaptive Morphology it basically means we're looking at different species, we're comparing different species, we might be comparing sexes and we're looking at the sort of morphology of the animal um, that may affect um, its, its adaptation, the way it lives, so what it might feed on, what sort of soils it might live in, and what sort of habitat and that sort of thing. So in this one I'm going to be focusing on the hands. Can we get anything um, out of the hands uh, as far as maybe learning about what the scorpion uh, might be doing in its life, how it might be living, and just have a general look at the morphology of the hands of Australian scorpions. So what can the morphology of a scorpion hand tell us about the scorpion? Okay, so the first thing you would say to yourself is, okay, well, what, does, what do the hands do? Clearly they are prim probably primarily one of their main, main, main objectives is capturing prey. So prey items, grabbing a prey item. Now is the prey item easily overpowered um, or not? So is it easy to, to grab a hold of or is it not easy to grab a hold of? So the scorpion um, is going to be um, addressing different kinds of prey depending on where it lives and depending on how it lives. And that then will influence the kind of morphology of the hands as well as other things of course but we're just looking at the hands here so are prey items easily overpowered or not um, way of life so is the scorpion a wanderer does it wander about um, or does it sit at home in a burrow the burrow entrance and and catch its prey um, there's a big difference in those two ways of life gender Okay, so do the hands vary with gender? So is there a sexual dimorphism? Do we see a difference between the male and the female as far as the hands are concerned? We'll have a look at that. And no doubt there will be other factors which simply we are not aware of. It's, we can really only look at what's fairly obvious. Um, if you did empirical studies where you did a lot of measurements, you might then um, be able to come up with other things that vary between different species and different and, and sexes as well but we're just looking here at what we can sort of easily fairly easily see so let's have a look at the general morphology the basic morphology we've got the hand which is like the main part of the hand here called the manus or the or the keeler um, contains some muscles um, and then Dorsally, on the, on the dorsal aspect of the hand, we have the fixed finger coming out, which is, which is part of or an extension of the manus. And then underneath, we have a movable finger or an articulated finger. So the one that's underneath uh, moves up and down. So the scorpion can grab. Okay, and of course, we have then have, you can see quite clearly here, this row of very fine teeth. Um, on the inner margin of both the lower of both the movable finger and the fixed finger and if you look carefully you'll see here you can see these large darker areas on the top um, finger these are clusters of denticles you can see them here in the close-up I think it's like one two three denticles there and one two three here and their teeth as well so for whatever reason um, these denticles, or these groups of denticles, have also um, evolved and been successful um, in the morphology of the hand, and one could speculate as to why. Okay, so that's the general morphology. What I've done is I have broken our scorpions up into three major morphological groups. This could be done in multiple ways. You could look at um, the morphology of the hands and broke them up into other groups. This is just the way I've done it here. So group one um, is, the, is the group where 
the hand, the actual manus is very small, it's comparatively small, and the fingers are comparatively long. And this group contains the buthids, which are the, generally the small scorpions. Lycus, um, Australian lycus, we don't probably really have any lycus in Australia, lycus is a, uh, uh, an overseas species, but we call our, our scorpions at the moment, we still call them lycus, <coughs> excuse me, here in Australia. So lycus, isometroides, very much an Australian genus, um, hemulycus, which is probably um, in the same um, general group as isometroides, in fact may even be a variant of isometroides, uh, isometris, um, and Australobuthus, the inland salt lake scorpion. So all these buthids have the same common overall morphology of the hand, small manus, long fingers. Then if we look at group two, or, uh, these are the, the larger, chunkier sorts of scorpions. So we're looking at scorpions that have a large manus, you can see here a very large manus, and medium to short fingers. So the fingers do vary a little bit in length, as they do in this group as well. But in this group, the fingers are never, that I'm aware of, I don't think they're ever longer, ever longer than the manus. Whereas here, they are invariably longer. Okay, so usually shorter than the manus, or maybe up to the length of the manus for the fingers in this group. Eurydacus, uh, the Eurydacids, the Bothriurids, which contain uh, Cercophonius and the Hormurids, which are the rainforest type scorpions. So you've got your um, Hormurus, um, which used to be Lycales, and then we've still got Lycales in Australia as well. So all those scorpions have that same kind of um, general morphology for the hand. Then the group three is an additional group that I've added because it's a sort of a subset of Hormurus and Lycales. It's, it's the male of Hormurus of, of Hormurus and Lycalis. Not all males have this particular morphology of the hand, um, not all species within this, uh, within the Hormurids, but probably most, I would say the majority of them have this male sexual dimorphism where the hand is, the manus is greatly elongated. And there's also a secondary sexual, there's a, there's a, section, there's a secondary sexual characteristic in here uh, called the tooth and notch, which I'll talk about when we look at the group. So three distinct groups. The buthids, the uridacids, they're the main, the main two groups for the first two, and then you've got this sexual dimorphism group within the hormurids in the last group. So group one, small manus, long fingers. When you're a scorpion that is a wanderer, and all these group one scorpions are wanderers. When you're in that group, you don't want to have large PD pals because it's too energetically expensive for one thing to go wandering about all over the countryside, dragging around big hands. That would that would be um, that wouldn't be selected for in natural selection. That'd be selected against because it's, because it's just too energetically expensive. Additionally, uh, it's cumbersome. It would slow the animal down, so it's more like it would be more likely to be taken um, as a prey item from another animal, from a, from another predator. Um, it might make it more difficult for the animal to get into tight places and to be able to escape and get away. So all of our wanderers have these much smaller PD pals compared to group two, um, and also of course the manus and the fingers are all in this kind of orientation where the manus is small, the fingers are long. So you might, you know, might ask why would that why would that be the case? Um, these animals are, as I said, they're active. They're active out on the ground. They're active hunters, so they don't sit and wait for prey in one place they go wandering about. So they're going to come across things like little spiders running around, um, small insects of all sort, little, you know, small beetles, um, and this kind of thing. So it could be that the long fingers enable them to snare the legs of something like a spider, or 
maybe the wings of a of an antlion, a neuropteran, and maybe maybe the wings of a moth. Because if we look at the manus, the manus is small. That's where the muscles are. So what we're seeing here is an animal that's got hasn't got a great deal of power in the hand. It's not it's not a, it's not a, a vice like grip or anything like that. It's 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 low power, and additionally the fingers are long. So if you imagine um, a set of bolt cutters, big bolt cutters, okay, so the long handles of the bolt cutters um, is where the power is applied, your force, your apply force, which would be equivalent to the manus in the scorpion. Then you've got the fulcrum, and then in bolt cutters you've got short jaws on the other side of the fulcrum, so you're applying all this, all this applied force is going into this tiny little area on the opposite side of the fulcrum, which if we look at it here, the scorpion's the same thing, but in this case we've got long fingers, so we're not really taking full advantage of the amount of power that's available. So it seems as though the more important factor is really the length of the fingers more so than the power in the hand. So it seems to me to be like a snaring thing, that having long fingers may well increase the chance of grabbing prey. And if you look at the fine teeth, you can imagine um, a small spider's leg being trapped by these teeth. The wings of a neuropteran, of a, of a lace wing or an outline being trapped by these very, very small teeth. And these larger teeth could be additionally there, then they might be there um, to catch a different subset of prey, a different kind of prey range. So here we have Lycus bucheri, which is an inland buthid, inland um, primarily um, inland, predominantly inland, I should say, um, species. Very variable. There's probably more than one species in the group, and it's pretty much mostly open, open, a little bit of leaf litter, but more sort of an open environment dweller. And um, here you can see it's caught a moth. Now, this moth was attracted to my headlamp. I was photographing the scorpion, and the moth was attracted to my headlamp. But bam, the scorpion, as soon as the moth landed near it, the scorpion grabbed it and immediately stung it. And you can see the scales, the moth scales around the, the um, aculeus, the stinging barb of the scorpion. So when you're a scorpion and you're out in the open, you're a wanderer, and you catch um, something like a moth, or some other sort of flying insect, it's going to be flapping, and it's going to be hitting the ground and creating vibrations. Invertebrates are very, very good at detecting vibrations. So the faster the scorpion can nail, can knock out its prey item and stop it from moving, the safer it becomes. It sort of it then goes into the cryptic mode again, where it's you know, into that stealth mode where nothing much is going to be able to find it. But if the moth's going bang, 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 bang against the soil, centipedes or uh, spiders or anything in the nearby vicinity could pick those vibrations up and, and head towards the scorpion. Um, this is Truncatus, which is a small species of inland inland uh, lycus. Um, Generally, they seem to occupy hills, rocky hillsides in interior South Australia. I found them rocky hillsides, and they tend to get into, from what I can see, disused spider burrows, a little bit like Isometroides. And fingers um, quite long. The main is robust. It's small, but it looks quite robust. And the, you can see the fingers are also um, have teeth that are quite large. Um, this is bucheri. This is a form of bucheri. This is a big one, 60 millimetres from the, the snout to, to the end of the telson, I think I measured it. And you can see here, the um, this is a female. The, um, the main is, is quite small. It's quite diminutive. The fingers are quite uh, long. So once again, not a lot of power here, but quite a good snaring ability and a decent stinger to knock out the prey. This is an inland, um, undescribed species of, uh, of lycus that lives in amongst leaf litter. 
And what I find with leaf litter uh, lichas is that they tend to have the smallest manus out of all of the of the buthids. So very, very short manus and very long fingers. I mean, the finger there is probably two and a half times, almost three times the length of the manus. And as you get away from leaf litter, out into more open areas, the scorpion, the species, then develops slightly larger manus. This, this ratio of manus to fingers changes. So the fingers that are a bit shorter, the manus is a bit bigger in the open, in the more open environments. So it wouldn't surprise me if this is because, once again, it increases the chances of grabbing something that's running past. It just increases the snaring ability because the fingers are so long, they've got lots of fine teeth, if you go snap, snap, you're more likely to capture the leg of something. So this is, as I said, more an open, an, an open environment scorpion. This is very closely related to Lycus bucheri, but it seems specialised within certain dune habitats. Um, fingers are still long, and manus is still relatively small, so it would have that history, that 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 past. Um, of living within leaf litter and now it's gradually evolving into more open environments. And then we've got Isometroides, which is considered to be um, a wolf spider specialist because it's been found a lot living inside wolf spider burrows. Um, it will certainly take other prey, I've kept them and, and they have no problems whatsoever catching, capturing other insects that you might put into their enclosure. Um, once again, small manus, very, very small, so not lots of power there, I wouldn't think. Um, fairly long fingers, large teeth, quite large teeth within the fingers. And when you've got uh, a metasoma like this, a huge stinging tail, it's got lots of power. This is where the work is. So this is a snare, allows high transport, low transport cost, high transport ability good snaring ability with long fingers and then a tail which just knocks the prey out really really quickly so you can't really look at something like the hand in isolation i mean you can look at it in isolation initially but then you should also look back at the rest of the animal and, and think to yourself well maybe how how's the whole animal changing um isometris in the same group isometris um, are mainly found in the coast uh, Queensland sort of coast, northern New South Wales, Queensland coast, more of a forested species and they have probably a slightly longer manus compared to finger length than lycus, most of the lycus, but generally very very similar and these once again are animals that that wander, they don't, they don't sit at home, they go out looking for their prey so they need small hands for mobility but they are more of a forested animal so they're, they're climbing up trees and up into logs and into leaf litter um, as opposed to operating in an open environment they don't operate in open environments they operate in much more vegetated areas um, just back to bucheri again this is now looking at sexual dimorphism so some of them some of the buthids do show some degree of sexual dimorphism um, in the hands, and the one that I've found that's most most prominent is is Lycus bucheri from the South Australian Mallee, and and also I think also even further up north, um, I've found them inland where there's a fair bit of sexual dimorphism too. So you can see the female manus is quite small, and the male one is quite large. Very very distinct. The male manus is quite robust. Why? The only thing I can possibly speculate is that um, this extra power enables the male to more successfully mate with a female. That's the only thing I can think of. They live, as far as I know, in the same manner, the male and the female, so their prey items you would think would be much the same. Um, so to me it's probably got to do with the male being able to control the female in the promenade 
but that's speculation I don't know like as Jonesy if we look at the male and the female there's really no apparent difference I can't see any obvious difference between the keeler the fingers um, in the male and female of Jonesy they look pretty much the same if you measured them with a micrometer and you measure enough of them you might get uh, some kind of differentiation between them but I'd say there's probably also a lot of overlap so then we move on to group 2 so group 2 are the animals that have got a much larger manus which means a lot more power more muscle a lot more power going on in here and small fingers to medium sized fingers now in these guys Eurodecus manicardus we're at the extreme end of this morphology and these guys are rock scrape dwellers and when I say extreme end of the morphology it's a bit like the bolt cutters you've got lots of power from the long arms of the bolt cutters you've got the fulcrum and then you've got a very very small bitey end well all that power is concentrated and this is the same thing with manicardus. You've got a lot of power in the manus. And that power has been concentrated in very small fingers. So it's taking advantage of the power. There's not a lot of point in having lots of power if you're going to have very long fingers. Because you're just dissipating the, uh, the forces being spread out across all of the long fingers. But in Manicardus, all that force has been concentrated. So it could be that um, I tend to think that it possibly is because they might be feeding a lot on beetles, hard shelled beetles. When you've got small fingers, you're not interested in snaring. It's not a snatch grab situation where you need to catch the leg of something. Because they live under rocks, things would come into the, into the rock space trying to find somewhere to go. A beetle might get under there, thing like I can get under here and, and 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 find shelter, and then the scorpion's under there and it can deal with the beetle. But it's going to require a lot of force to hold it because they've got hard shells. They can, they're quite strong and quite robust, especially a lot of ground beetles. And there are predatory ground beetles as well. And if you look at the burrows of these guys, look where they live, you'll find a lot of. I often do find a lot of beetle remains. So it wouldn't surprise me if they're feeding on something like that. But whatever it is they're feeding on, it, clearly it takes a fair bit of power to hold it. It's easily grabbed, but it takes a fair bit of power to hold it. And it's the same with this Eurodacus elongatus is another um, rock dwelling species. But here, look, the fingers are much longer. They're not, and they're slender. They're not that short, robust, strong, stocking finger. That Manicardus had. So it probably means that they have a different range of prey items because they live under a rock scrape in exactly the same way as Manicardus. It's a larger scorpion that then may well have some sort of influence over the hands but just because the animal is physically bigger. But it could also be that the prey range is different. Um, Eurodacus armatus we call these armatus, um, and there's lots of different ones found pretty much over at least the southern half of Australia, mostly inland. And as I said, they're quite variable and it's a species complex. But these guys are very, very similar to Manicardus. Very, very similar. They seem to have maintained a lot of what I would think would be their mesic origins. So, so they seem to maintain characters that are uh, more in tune with their ancestors than some of the other inland scorpions. So we see a large manus and short fingers. So this animal, once again, it doesn't seem to be something that's, it doesn't seem to want to just quickly snare, snatch and grab. It seems as though it's, it's evolved to more or less have something come right up to it and it grabs it and it has to hold it because it's really concentrating that power into the fingers. This is another Armatus type scorpion from uh, West Australia. And you can see once again, very, very large manus, 
very large minus short fingers concentration of power real biting holding ability um, and this is one from um, Roxby Downs area I photographed this is a juvenile and it's got a beetle this is a chrysomelid beetle I think a leaf beetle I think from the looks of it um, juveniles this is a juvenile and you can see the um, the hands of juveniles the main is, is often narrower why I don't know but it's common for juvenile scorpions to have uh, a manus which is which is narrower not as not as strong not as robust looking so it could be that they're just going for for smaller food items maybe their food range is more limited don't know what's going on there so this just shows some variation in some of the different armatus type scorpions that i've looked at and you can see that They've all got a fairly large manus. This one here from South Australian Mallee I found. It's the smallest in width. Um, South Australian Central, very, very wide, very powerful, and very short fingers. West Australian Wheat Belt, that was another one with a nice wide manus, but slightly longer fingers. Um, so you can see there's variation, there's subtle variation, but they're all much the same. Um, then we move on to the obligate burrowers that sit and wait at the mouth of their burrow. So we started with the rock scrape dwellers. Manicatus is a rock scrape dweller, as is Elongatus. Then we move to Armatus, which is an animal which doesn't feed at its burrow entrance. It, it, it moves away. It might be half a metre or a metre away from its burrow. It'll come out and sit nearby. Then we move to this one. These guys, Novo Hollandi and Yashenkoi, these scorpions sit at the mouth of their burrow and they wait for animals to come along within the vicinity of the mouth and they race out and they grab them. And they have, once again, large keeler, but often longer fingers than Manicata, than the rock scrape dwellers. And it may well be that um, the burrow assists them because the, because the burrow has a steep entrance it could be assisting them in catching their prey and maybe they don't need the same degree of biting force uh, that's another one uh, yeah, Nova Hollandi, same thing you can see the fingers here are longer than in Manicatus okay so Man Manicatus it would be probably about that long and um, probably a little drawing tool up Manicars would be about their finger length wise, I think, probably about two thirds the length of this finger. So this animal, for whatever reason, it's it's better for the animal to have slightly longer fingers. So I just think that if this was Manicardus, the finger would probably come to about here. rather than all the way down to here so I would think that this is about about 50% longer here than it would be in, in Manicardus okay let me change the slide okay this one is um, an inland undescribed species of Eurodecus from up around the Boxby warmer areas, lives in rocky habitats, digs a burrow, comes out and sits near the burrow. So it's a bit like Armatus, a very, very similar animal. Probably a sister species to Armatus. And you can see it's got the same kinds of, of, of hand arrangement. Very, very big manus. I mean, that's, there's a lot of power here. And that power has been concentrated into short, strong, thick, robust fingers. So whatever it's catching, it needs the power to hold it. And this is their burrow. This is the sort of gibber habitat they live in. And they come out and they'll sit nearby. They might sit here or over here or over here. They sort of sit around the burrow. Um, and then they wander back into the burrow after they've finished for the night. And this is Yashinkoi, okay, which is a, an, an obligate burrower sits at the mouth of the burrow and once again quite large hands you know, the manus is quite large 
and the fingers large, robust and dark, but a bit longer than the manicardus. Additionally, a very, very large, this is a male, has a very large stinger in this case. So they sit here and they detect vibration of a potential prey item out here, something like a spider's web. They detect the vibrations, they race out and they drag it back. So this burrow assists them in catching their prey so that then may influence the morphology of their hands as well. So if we look at it, yeah, this is just a general overview of some of the morphologies um, of the hands, Manicardus and Armatus. I've put them together because they're very, very similar. Large manus, small, tiny little short fingers, so a large concentration of force. The force has been concentrated into these little fingers. And then as we go up, the fingers tend to get a bit longer. Plantar manus and Novo Hollandii. Um, the manus, the manus is still large, but the fingers are longer. Um, Elongatus, we have an even larger manus, but these are all to scale. So Elongatus is a big animal, so you can see that the whole PD palp is bigger. But you can see the real, the one that's got the most biting power is Manicardus. And then we, we sort of send, we, we move away from there. We move towards Armatus, and then we move maybe Nova Hollandia, Hollandia, this one, um, right up to Yashenko and Elongatus, where the fingers get longer. So in group two, also Bothriurids, we have Cercophonius. And Cercophonius is a bit, is a bit sort of in between the, the Buthids and the, uh, and the Eurodacids. So the manus is a bit longer, sort of more elongated, and the fingers are yeah, fairly long as well. So uh, I'd still put it in group two. It's definitely not a buthid type of a hand, but it's a little bit in between. And these guys are an unusual scorpion. They seem to live in amongst um, you know, rotten, like old stumps in the ground. They'll dig down into the, the stump areas underneath trees. You'll find them in amongst like root systems and that sort of thing. And they don't really come out and wander, apart from the male. The males will come out and wander. Uh, the rest of them don't. So whatever they're feeding on are things that are coming down into their, into their burrow areas and in, in and around their burrow areas. And it seems like they've got some sort of intermediate. So there's a bit of snaring. The fingers are longish, but it doesn't appear as though they need huge amounts of power. Um, this is assuming that the muscles are the same in all of them, which may be completely incorrect. It might be that this one has evolved powerful muscles. I don't, I don't know. We can't tell that from looking from the outside. But what does happen with Cercophonius is we do have a sexual dimorphism in the hand. When the male uh, finally molts into the, the last instar, into the adult stage, the male develops these little bumps on the inside of the hand. You, oh, I've got my little timer thing here. You can see them here sticking out. And here, so it's one, two, and three. And they're called apophyses which is plural, more than one. So the inner keel, inner keel um, apophysis. And these enable the male to grip the female during the promenade. So that's a sexual dimorphism within the manus or the hand uh, of this genus. Now, um, Homerus. So now we're getting into the rainforesty kinds of scorpions, the scorpions that live in the... In the um, the high rainfall areas, Queensland, across uh, the north of Australia, northwest and western Australia. And uh, they're very much like Eurodacus as far as the hand is concerned. Um, they don't have the keels. That's a different story. You can see that there's no keel across here. It seems to have lost it. But the shape of the main of the manus and the shape of the fingers is very similar to Eurodacus. A fair bit of power is going on here, and fairly short fingers, and a lot of muscle in here, a lot of strength. And, and if you look at the size of the, um, the singing apparatus, it's not particularly great. So these animals are really relying on grip, 
they do still sing their prey, but they're relying on grit. Um, and this is like Kelly's, same thing, virtually identical. Large manus, short fingers, relying on grit. It's not a snaring, it's not a snatch and grab thing like a lycus. It's more of a slow, deliberate grab and then lots of power to hold. But then we move to group three, and as I said, group three is a subset of group two. So it's just the males of most species of Hormurus and Lycalis have this sexual dimorphism. So the PD palps are greatly elongated in the male. They're like really seriously exaggerated. And part of that exaggeration of the palp is the elongated keela or manus. This part here is greatly elongated. And we also have a tooth and notch. So the tooth and notch is a sexual dimorphism only found in the male. Um, it's, it's you've got this this tooth here on the movable finger. You've got a notch on the on the fixed finger, and this enables the male to lock onto the female for the promenade. And then why would that be? Well. Hormurus, like Helles, uh, live in tight spaces there. They, they, they tend to occupy things like rock crevices, and that's why their dorsi ventrally flattened. That's also why they have a very, very short metasoma. So you can see this little tiny metasoma enables the scorpion to back into a tight space. So here's the female, here's the male. This is a rock crevice, and the female she's going to back into here as she would do with any predator if she feels threatened at all she'll back in so her morphology is is has evolved such that her front end is wider than her back end so she so she has wider hands the head and is 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 is, is not wider deeper i should say and then it tapers down so once again, see here, it's, this is the, the deepest part of the animals here. And then as we get back to this thin area, she can lay her tail down flat. So it tapers down. So her body is, has designed, has evolved to, to fit into these tight, tight crevices. Now the male, who has to get the female, he has to do the opposite thing. He has to go, his body is also has also evolved and has an evolutionary design that enables it to back in, but he has to go in forwards. So that's a problem. It's like trying to put a, you know, a, um, a, a round object into a square hole. It doesn't, doesn't fit too well. So long arms, long arms help a lot. These long arms enable him to reach into this crevice to grab the female. And when he grabs her, she's got she's got adaptations. You can just see these little dark areas here. These enable the scorpion to bite onto the substrate. So the scorpion's hard to pull out. So having this tooth and notch enables the male to lock onto the female and pull the female out. So that's what he does. He's got extra length in his arms. He can grab the female and he can then extract the female from the rock space. And I just did this little sketch which I which I created from images. On the left this is the female and this is the male. These are drawn to scale and also I drew them on the same level. So this is a this is the same pivot point in each case here. And you can see the extension, the female compared to the male. Okay, much greater extension in the male. He has a much greater reach. So this is increased in length. The keeler and fixed finger is longer than it is, but so are these segments. These segments are also longer than they are in the female. So that's a sexual dimorphism which has occurred in the hand. Um, of this particular group of scorpions. 
Okay, so that's about it. I hope you got something out of it. Um, there's a little bit we can learn from the hands. They're a little bit more complex than meets the eye. There's a lot going on because you can't really see them in isolation. You really then do have to look at the rest of the animal as well and get some idea of what's going on. But if you start looking at things like this, you can then start, start understanding a bit about what's going on. So if you see a scorpion that you've never seen before, you've never seen it, it could be from overseas or anywhere, look at the hands, look at the fingers, look at the size of the, of the manus. Is it, is it small? Is it robust? Um, you know, is there going to be a difference between males and females? You don't know until you can compare. So um, if you want to know more about scorpions, um, grab my book. It's available um, these days as an ebook on Amazon. Uh, Amazon also give a print version. Um, go back and watch the, the first video on the tail. I'll talk about the tail and the morphology of the tail. If you like the video, leave a thumbs up and subscribe. Okay, thanks for watching. Cheers.